So this is the 75th anniversary of Parsage and Turner's original description of the syndrome, uh, which they termed uh, brachial amyotrophy, highlighting the early atrophy and significant pain that associated with the condition. I'm Christopher Klein, and I am professor of neurology here at Mayo Clinic, and I'm very pleased to uh, announce a uh, a paper a review article that's going to be published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, and it deals with um, the topic of Harshner-Turner syndrome and hereditary brachial plexus neuropathy. And since that time, we've learned quite a bit. They described soldiers during World War II and their experience to note a very high rate of antecedent, precedent events such as trauma, infection, and surgical events. And it was only in the 70s when the Mayo Clinic reported a very large series that we learned more about um, the long-term prognosis, localizations, and association of those antecedent events with outcomes. And still further moving to the present day, we now have a genetic cause for those patients who have the hereditary form, which is largely indistinguishable in onsets compared to partner turner syndrome. And so young age of onset, recurrence, and postpartum attacks are, are more common with the hereditary form, but the actual attacks themselves are really not much different. A very important thing here, just report recently, is the role of primary care physicians in making this diagnosis. So in the Netherlands, uh, a group arranged for primary care doctors to be specifically trained on recognition of this condition. And through that approach, they were able to create an updated um, prevalence of the disorder to be much more common than we previously thought. So previously, it was thought that about three in 100,000 persons per year would have an attack. But after that very thoughtful Netherlands study with primary care physicians, the uh, incidence is thought to be as high as 100 in 100,000. And this sort of capitulates what I see as a neuromuscular doctor working in the EMG lab, how common this disorder actually is. So we assembled a group of Mayo experts dealing with the multidisciplinary nature of this disorder to provide a very large comprehensive review of the subject. Um, and we think that regardless of your experience with this condition, you'll find it a useful read. Uh, we highlighted some of the recent um, observations with this condition, including the role of prophylactic immunotherapy for patients with specifically the hereditary forms where surgery and childbirth are known to um, produce a risk for recurrent attacks, which are common in that condition. We also highlight the association of COVID, not only infection, but also vaccination with attacks and more recently now with the association of PD-1 checkpoint immunotherapy for, chem uh, for cancer in this condition. We also highlight the common involvement of the phrenic nerve, um, and we have uh, colleagues both from our pulmonary medicine group, but also our uh, physiatry group dealing with this very important issue, which occurs in about 10% of patients and can be associated with significant uh, comorbidity and, and even mortality, especially among patients who go swimming and are not aware that they have phrenic involvement. Most helpful has been the application of ultrasound to identify among patients who may or may not have orthopnea or exertional dyspnea diaphragmatic involvement. So it turns out when patients are so sick with pain and weakness, they often don't exert themselves. So we aren't aware of their their uh, dyspnea or their phrenic involvement. So we've learned that by the application of diaphragmatic ultrasound, we have greatest sensitivity and specificity um, that can be complemented by pulmonary function tests. We also show the uh, videos of a patient who had phrenic involvement and it was identifiable through ultrasound. Imaging can be quite helpful and we actually had involvement from one of our uh, neuroradiologists in distinguishing this disorder from other musculoskeletal or even radicular, uh, cervical radicular cause. And what you typically see is multifocal muscle involvements, nerve T2 signal hyperintensity, 
that helps you sort out the differential diagnosis of capsulitis, tendonitis, and other forms. So one of the contributions Mayo made was the pathologic description of attacks associated with marked inflammatory infiltrates, not only in the sporadic Parsons Turner patients, but also in the hereditary SEP9 genetic causal patients. And so it kind of has an appearance of a microvasculitis, which we illustrate in an attack of anterior neurosis syndrome. Um, and although the inflammation is really quite present at onset, it's not clear that it is the sole cause, but it may be reactionary because steroids help with this significant pain at the onset, but they really don't necessarily prevent uh, progression of the motor deficits. And lastly, we involved our uh, colleagues from the clinical genetics lab, reviewing the um, specific sequencing that's important to do in patients with the familial form to make a specific diagnosis. Um, the review article, I think, is, is nice. It highlights the Mayo strengths, the collaborative nature of this condition, including therapeutic options for patients, not only in prophylaxis, but in um, managing the attacks. So we, we, we really emphasize quite a bit the identification and the utilization of modern tools like imaging, ultrasound, neurophysiology to make the right diagnosis. But then once you make the diagnosis, what is the appropriate therapy? So we review the role of steroids, pain management, and importantly, the early involvement of physiatry to prevent contractures and long-term deficits. Because most patients, if they're managed well, will ultimately have a good outcome. There are a very small percentage of patients, however, that do not do well and have major prolonged disability from weakness predominantly. And we reviewed the literature about the utility of neurolysis, nerve grafts, and to, rev to reveal and discuss that the, the role of these interventions are probably not real well established yet. And still for the worst patients, uh, tendon transfers, uh, which arose largely out of traumatic uh, brachial plexus literature, still remains the mainstay for the worst patients who are doing poorly and need functional improvements through a surgical intervention. So I think that um, the readership will find it useful. Um, there really hasn't been a very comprehensive review re recently in the literature. And I think for all the reasons I mentioned that, that you'll find this a very helpful article in your practice. And you'll not only be better at recognizing it, but in terms of managing it, you'll become, um, you know, superior. So I hope you enjoy reading it. And um, we're very uh, pleased to present it in the, this uh, journal, the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Thank you very much. We hope you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you'll find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook, you can also follow us on Twitter. More information about Healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.